Hey everyone, welcome to week three of our class. I have enjoyed reading your assignments and your work so much. I had to just say that because your discussion post this week blew me away. I was so impressed at how thorough you all were in discussing the article and and honestly, it seemed to really shock you all just as much as it did me the first time I read it. And it really does get us all, you know, passionate and, and really wanting to make sure that our special education students in our classes will never have to face the same thing that those students did. And thank goodness times have progressed and things have gotten better, but there's still a lot of room for improvement, which a lot of you had mentioned in your discussion post. So we are the people who get to create that change. If you end up going the general education route, let's say, then you will have students with special needs in your classrooms and you'll get to be the person to really look out for them and make sure that they have accommodations, they have everything they need. Half of you are general ed teachers only and half of you are general ed and special ed. So if you are in the general ed only crowd, I want to just say, seriously think about be just adding the special education component to your education. And the reason I say this is because I was elementary ed only for quite, well, actually until I was a junior in college. And I added it kind of at the last minute and it was the best decision of my life because it gave me more strategies. It made me well-rounded because elementary ed is you know you get to be creative and you learn great strategies and then special ed is a great complement to that you learn accommodation and how to work with students who don't learn the same and all students don't learn in the same way so it's highly recommended that you think about it and if you don't no judgment but it will make you marketable and it will open up your job opportunities to basically be endless because special ed's k through 12 and then you'll have your other portion whether it's elementary middle or high so just a plug there and if that article made you really stop and think and say hey i i want to be an advocate for this population well you can as a general ed teacher and you can also do it as a special ed teacher which is so exciting so thank you for your amazing insights input and thanks for working hard i you don't know how much it means to me because I'm working hard on this end and I can see that you all are doing that too. So let's get started. Today we're talking about evidence-based practices and how to be a good consumer of research. And at first sight, that might terrify you all because you might think, oh my gosh, research sounds so boring. And I researched the last five years of my life and I can tell you, though it does come across boring, it also can be the most interesting thing because when you see that something you worked so hard on finally works, it's the most exciting thing. And it's not just for us nerds like myself. So I think you all will find a lot of use in this and I'll give you the reasons why in a second. So first of all, how many of you love Pinterest and if we were in a live class right now, I would love to hear from you about your opinions on Pinterest. Personally, I love it. I love going and looking at clothes and vacation ideas and recipes. That's what Pinterest is intended for. So as teachers, let's put a giant red circle and a, a slash through it, okay? We are cutting out Pinterest as teachers. Now, if you wanna make a bulletin board and you want ideas on you know, cute holiday ideas, that's one thing. When it comes to teaching and strategies, let's just not go there. It's very rare unless they put research articles to back it that those little posts and pins as they call them are even research based. So let's go for the research because the thing about that is that we know it works and we only want to use things that works to help our students. Why do trial and error on them? They are too precious and too valuable, and we do not want to waste time on their education just testing things on them. So let's do what works. Speaking of what works, this is a great lead in. What Works Clearinghouse is the top voice on what research is good, 
and what research isn't. They set the standards on every piece of, you know, in the textbooks. Textbooks are all research based. They get these from articles and from different places in the research base that they find. So what you see in this textbook is awesome. Go for that. And you have to know that What Works Clearinghouse had their hand in there at some point. So these are the steps that they take. They screen the studies, they review them, they give them a rating, and this is a little bit of their process and you don't have to know the, the you know, fine, fine details, but I do want you to know that they go through a ton of steps to figure out if that research article that's out there meets the standards. They call them the golden, st golden standards of research, meaning you can trust this and it really works for students and we recommend you use this in your classroom. So that's green. Yellow means it was okay. It had some flaws in the research design, but you could still use it. It won't hurt anything. And then red means obviously this study is not good. They did not do things in the correct way and it's misleading data. Don't use it. So most of you all are on Facebook, I'm sure, and you know the number of research articles and information that is out there, fake news that is out there. You have to be so careful on what you allow in because you got to make sure that it's accurate before you just take it in. It's no different from Facebook than it is for your students. People say all kinds of things that work, but if you don't have research to back it up, meaning they spent a lot of time making sure that this was accurate, then we don't want to use it. So that's, that's like the foundational basis of what we're going to talk about with research. The reason, let me back up a second, the reason you need to know this, and I'm going to go through in just a few minutes, the details of how to read and understand the research because this week for your discussion post, you are going to go through, find a research article, and you are going to pull the main pieces out of it to make sure, hey, this is a good one. Then you're going to post that article and the outline of it on the discussion board. The beautiful thing about this is that you, at the end of this discussion, I'm going to try and pull the PDFs that you post and create a whole folder for you. So right off the bat, you're gonna have 30 evidence-based practice articles that you can take into your classroom with you. That's awesome because trust me, when you become a teacher, it can get hard to get access to these because only when you're at a university do you get access to the article base, which I think is a huge flaw of education. It makes no sense to tell teachers, go look up articles and and make sure it's all evidence-based practices, but then they don't have access to them. So that's a future advocacy. If one of you want to pick that up and lead the charge on this, I will be standing behind you <laughs> because I think teachers should have access to finding articles. Anyways, let's move on and let's take a look at what in, is entailed as you find the article. So this is basic. Every experiment or intervention has to have variables. And this goes back to our science classes when we were younger. I know some of you are science majors and you're gonna teach science classes. This is for you. This is your main <laughs> land. The reason I'm bringing this very basic piece of information up again is because it's so easy to get them switched. Just remember that the, the dependent variable is your outcome measure. The independent variable is the intervention. And the way I remember that is independent starts with an I, intervention starts with an I. So I always remember IV, independent variable, intervention. Dependent variable, outcome. So just to make that more clear, if you have, let's say you have 50 plants and you take those 50 plants and you water them a lot every day, right? So your intervention, you're trying to see what is manipulated, what has changed, the amount of water. So one plant gets a little water, one plant gets a lot of water, one plant gets a little fertilizer, one plant gets a lot of fertilizer. That's your independent variable, it's what's being changed. 
dependent variable is your outcome. How tall is the plant after you water it? And that's just one example just to help us refresh and remember from back in the olden days when we learned about this, because it will apply to research in education. So there are two types of designs that researchers typically use, and you're going to see this when you're out there looking for articles this week. Group design and single case design. I'm starting with group design because it's the more simple one, I would say. It's not it's simpler to explain, I should say. So group, you always have an experimental group, as you can see at this picture. The experiment is, will student test scores be affected by distracting sound in the testing environment? So you want to know if you have a mariachi band in the back, are your students still going to learn? <laughs> I think we know the answer to that, but they want to know in an experiment form. So the experimental group is over here. You might have 50 students. That could be maybe two classes that have the mariachi band. And then you have two classes that do not have the mariachi band in the back. They have a very quiet room and they can test in silence. That's your control group because that's what's typical already. This is the experimental group. So you have to have a ton of students in order to make this statistically significant you use statistics to determine if your group design worked. Now, those of you who love math and science are going to love that. Those of us, I do group design in my research. That's pretty much all that I focus on. But I do hire a statistician <laughs> because I know how to work a group design and work with students. But I'm so thankful for you all who love math and do it well. So just know that group design, you'll need to know this for your quiz because we're including lectures in your quizzes. Group design, you have lots and lots of students. You have an experimental group, you have a control group. To analyze group data, you use statistics. Okay, as long as you know that, you're, you're gonna do well. And I did cover that there, that you will use statistics to analyze. Remember, you do focus on averages of the group as a whole. You don't want to know how three students did in the mariachi band group compared to three students in the control. You want to know how all 50 did on average to see the scores and how they did. Single case is completely different. So single case deals with, as the name <laughs> portrays, either one to five students typically. And people who are experts in the single case design world will tell you, if you only have one student in your experiment, you're asking for trouble because let's say that my student, I have Jerome, and he is the best student. I was so excited to work with him and do the single case design with him, but he ended up transferring to another district. So he is now gone. My experiment or my single case design is over. I cannot use it anymore because he left. That's the danger. That's why they recommend that you have three to five participants when you take single case design data. That way, if anyone drops out due to attrition, you're okay. You still have people. Uh, so you evaluate performance of individuals and not groups in single case, which is very important to remember for your quiz as well. Okay. This is so important. You might think, why in the world is she going over <laughs> designs when I might not use that in my classroom? Here's the thing, you will. General ed teachers and special ed teachers will both use single case design often. Because if you've already read your text, you will see there's response to intervention, there's the PBIS, which you know, you're watching behavior with that one. RTI is more academic intervention. You have uh, the universal design for learning. You have, there's so many acronyms, you know, UDL, RTI, MTSS. I'm telling you, education is alphabet soup. <laughs> it's just how we are. With each one of those, you have to collect data to know if your academic intervention worked, whether your behavioral intervention worked. You need to know if your curriculum had an effect. That's why we give a pretest 
and a post test. And that is more group design, but I just want you to know why we collect data. So you might give them a test before the curriculum unit starts and they all get 20% on it. And then after you teach the curriculum, they're up to 80%. You know your curriculum worked. <laughs> so everything you do in education has to do with either a group design or single case. You might just not have known the terms for it. So, so let's look at this right now. Here's what teachers typically do, especially special educators. And those of you who are general ed, you will want to know this because you'll have to go to IEP meetings once a year, if not multiple times a year for students. And they're going to hand you a chart that could look like this or just a typical line graph as well. And you need to know what that means. So typical teachers will say, this student's just bothering me in my class. They're, I just know that they're talking out they just talk out so much in my classroom. When we actually go to collect the data, I've seen this numerous times when I go out to classrooms to help teachers who are struggling with students academically or behaviorally, and they'll just complain to me and say, I can't get the student to stop talking out. I can't get them to stop walking around the class. And of course, when you have 30 students in front of you, it feels amplified. So when I go in and actually collect data and see how many times they talked out in class, this, the teacher said that it had to be at least 20 to 30 times that they talked out in 60 minutes. When I go and actually collect the data, it was only 10 times. So that's a big difference between the two. And you can't go by your feelings on this. You can't go and say, I think that they're doing terribly in reading. Well, you need to know for sure. <laughs> and that's what baseline data is. You need to collect data and have it on record how they're doing before you start an intervention. And an intervention could be, like I said before, behavioral, an academic intervention, could be a curriculum you put in place. See how things are before. For single case, if you only have a couple students, you just collect the data points. So according to this graph right here, student performance, let's say that they only answered questions, number of responses, 10 times. So you have a group of 30 students in your class, and out of 30 students, they're just not answering your questions. They're either lacking motivation, they're not interested in the material, something's going wrong. And so you think, gosh, as a teacher, I have to do something. I need to have more interaction in my classroom. So for four days, you decide to count the numbers. So you intentionally ask questions and every time someone answers you, you have a little notepad in front of you and you just tally it. At the end of the hour, you see, oh my gosh, they only answered 10 questions. I asked so many questions, this is crazy. So you have to then say, all right, I have proof that something is wrong and that's what your baseline tells you. Now I need to put an intervention in place. So the teacher who's trying to get more responses and interaction out of her class, let's say she decides to put in place a group contingency in her classroom. She splits the, the 30 students into two groups. There's 15 and 15. On the whiteboard, she makes a tally score. She tells them whoever gets the most answers in by the end of the hour gets an extra 10 minutes at lunchtime today. Now let's say that these are high school students or middle school students. They love lunchtime with their friends. So they're so motivated to do this. So she asks a bunch of questions during the 60 minutes according to her content objectives. And lo and behold, that incentive in the game that she put in place, which is the intervention, worked. Look, she's up to 45 People are answering 45 times, 35, 30. You can see that there's a huge jump between how things were before until how things are after the intervention. That's when you know things worked. Real quick, let me show you an example of something that didn't work. And I'm jumping ahead here, but it's for a reason. You can see here that this, whoever did this research or classroom experiment, it didn't work for them. And the reason why is because their baseline is exactly the same as the intervention. If your data doesn't have a gap between it, between baseline and intervention, this means it works. 
this means it didn't because there was no change from before till after. And that means you need to go back to the drawing board and choose a different intervention. So I do, I must say, I really do miss live classes sometimes just for the fact that you can ask me questions and we can interact and have discussion. So I do, I do miss that portion so much and, and getting to know you guys in that way. But if you do have questions during the week about this, email me or come to the Zoom sessions or set up a meeting with me. I am more than happy to help in any way possible. So by now you should understand the concept of baseline. Baseline is what's happening before you intervene. And it's so important to get that on paper because otherwise teachers, we go by our feelings and we think they just aren't getting it or they're talking out too much, but we don't have proof until we take data like this. Just remember that your baseline data should have at least three points. So you can't say on day one, oh, their, their responses are low and then think that's a problem and jump to your intervention. You need to see at least three days in a row if their responses are really low. If when you take that data, it's low, then it's high, then it's low, then it's high. That means it's unstable and you can't start an intervention until it looks like this. All of these options say you cannot start the intervention because it's not, you don't know for sure if what you're about to do is going to be the reason why things get better. If you have a baseline that looks like this, one day they're doing terrible, one day they're doing great, next day they're doing terrible. So when you go to your intervention, how do you know that they're doing great in your intervention just because their intervention or is it because they were going up and down before intervention started? It's, you just can't do it that way. If you need more explanation on this, like I said, reach out to me because it's so hard to get feedback unless I'm with you live. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this, I just wanted to point out if I haven't already, this dotted line means intervention has been implemented. That's very important for you to know as well. That's the way to tell even on special education data, which you'll see at IEP meetings when you go to them. Or if you're a special ed teacher, you have to collect this. You're going to have some baseline and then you have intervention and then from then on you're going to hope that it gets better. That's, that's the goal of making goals, you know, is to help our students change into the positive direction. So this is what a typical special education data or RTI data, PBIS data, this is what it's going to look like. This is an AB design. So you have your baselines very low in the beginning. It did jump a little bit, but do you see that after it jumped, they had to take three more days of stable data? And that's what you'd have to do as well. Then they put the intervention in place. That's what this line means. And then their first phase of intervention, you can see it went up. You can see there's a gap there, which that's a good sign. Then their next phase of intervention, it went up even more. Sometimes interventions take time. If it's not working at first, don't just throw it out. Give it at least two weeks before you say, this isn't working, I'm gonna try something new. Because everyone takes adjustment time and it's true for students too. So you could have set an academic intervention in place for an RTI session that you have to hold. Maybe with PBIS, maybe the PBIS coach, which there's usually a PBIS coach in a school and they help teachers manage behavior, but they'll ask teachers to help them collect data since they're in the classroom. So you have to collect things like this, general ed and special education. So maybe by the time you give them the data, it's looking, wow, it's looking better and better. Or maybe there could be a hundred other reasons why you would collect data like this. Teachers are have to become good at graphs, I'm telling you. And then this teacher took follow-up data. Let's say the students did really well. They met maybe 90% to 100% criteria for three days. And you say, okay, that's great. They're getting it. I'm not gonna put the intervention in place anymore, but in two weeks, I'm gonna check up on them and see if it's still working for them. 
or you can keep the intervention in place until the end of the semester if you know that it's working. But you don't have to monitor it forever. Just monitor, monitor it for at least five data points that you'd say, wow, they're meeting their goal, and then you go back to collecting data intermittently to make sure that it's still working. This is an example of an IEP goal. And like I said, general ed or special ed need to know this because you'll see it at IEP meetings. So a student will read 10 words with 90% accuracy for four out of five trials. You should have taken baseline data. So let's say that teacher took baseline data day one, day two, day three. And their baseline data should have showed that it was low. Maybe the student had 20% accuracy, then 25% accuracy, and then 23% accuracy day one, day two, day three. Then you put the intervention in place. Maybe it's some type of reading program or new strategy that's evidence-based practice. And you put that in place and then look, it jumps up day 10, 11, 12, 80%, 95, 100, 90. So, after these five days, they've reached 90% accuracy. So I would say if they continue on this trend, that by the end of the year, that student with the IEP goal that says 90% accuracy for 10 words, it should either be increased or you should take the goal away because they met their goal and put something new in. Some teachers and special ed teachers will just keep going with a goal for years, even if the student's meeting it, and that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. These are extra terms if you had questions about what each of these terms meant on this graph. This you will not be quizzed on, you will not be tested on, but it's there in case you need a reference or a guide. This, I want you to know that there are different types of single case design in case you come across them in your articles, but the only one you need to know for a quiz situation would be AB design, because this is the one that's most commonly used with teachers. But do know that it does not show a functional relationship. You cannot guarantee that it was your intervention that cause the change unless you bring it back to baseline again, which is the ABA design. But this is typically used by teachers and special education teachers and it's, it's fine and it's workable as well. And that's the example I showed you before, which their intervention did not work, but you can see there's a baseline and intervention and that's it, that's AB design. From, you don't need to know this for the quiz, but in case you run across it on your article, ABA design just means, like I said before, you could do the baseline, you implement the intervention, and then you go back to baseline. That means you take away the intervention to see if that was the actual cause. It's hard for teachers to do this. I see researchers using this and the other ones more because it has to be really watched over <laughs> because it can be unethical if you take an intervention that's working for a student, if you just take it away for the sake of research, you know, that, that can be a discussion point. Uh, there's a withdrawal design, which is ABAB, which is baseline intervention, baseline intervention. I did that on a cell phone study that I conducted. I let them use their cell phones however they normally would, and it was way up here on the the amount of minutes that they spent on their cell phones. Then I put an, a cell phone intervention in place and the numbers went low. I told them the next week on the third week, you can use your cell phones again, however you want to. The cell phone usage went way back up to the highest number, you know, students with cell phones when they're allowed to use them. And then I told them, okay, here's the intervention, we're putting it back in place and the cell phones went down. That's what a typical ABAB design is for. And cell phone usage is one of those that is not unethical. You're allowed to tell them to put their cell phones away and that's a really good design for ABAB. Uh, this is alternating treatment design, meaning you do a baseline and you compare to, there are two interventions that already work, but you wanna know which one's the more effective one. And then this is multiple baseline and you can test interventions between students. Just so you know what those pictures look like. 